Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Anthony. I'm Regional Managing Partner for RSM in the South. And along with uh, HSBC, Erwin Mitchell and CMA, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Solent 250 webinar today, exploring how businesses can drive value through sustainability. I'm sure you will agree that the subject matter of climate change and sustainability is an issue talked about almost on a daily basis, whether that's in the press, on television, or through our world leaders. And climate change has been one of the most challenging business issues that we've ever faced. Um, there is widespread recognition that if we don't find new sustainable ways of doing business, the, the social and economic impact is going to be, well, quite severe and potentially irreversible. And I think this is one of those situations where business as usual going forward, just simply, it, it, it won't be enough. Um, but on a much more positive note, I think if we look part, back over the last decade, attitudes towards sustainability um, have changed somewhat. I think whether that's to do with the, the, the more um, ethically aware consumer or the heightened awareness of the, of the issue by business, it's starting to have a much more positive impact. And now many see sustainability as a driver of value rather than historically it's been, it's been maybe seen as a cost burden. So we're joined today by a fantastic panel who are going to uh, talk through their own views and share their experiences of why sustainability is important to them, what they've been doing in their own businesses and how it's starting to impact their future plans and their business models. In a few minutes, the panel will introduce themselves, but I first wanted to pass across to Rob King. Um, he's head of sustainable finance at HSBC. And Rob is responsible for promoting and developing solutions for, for corporates as they as they transition their way to the low carbon economy. Rob has very kindly agreed to chair the discussion this morning. And so please let me now pass across to Rob. HSBC is committed to helping our customers be more sustainable and transition to a net zero economy. We've committed to becoming a net zero bank, including our finance emissions by 2050 or sooner, and to providing 750 billion to a trillion of sustainable finance by 2030. And our customers in the UK have told us that sustainability is important to them. So around 90% of our customers say that they of our customers say they, they view a focus on sustainability as a tool for growth. So delighted to be here today to hear hopefully some perspectives on sustainability from our fantastic array of panelists. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, I'm hoping our panelists can hear me. So maybe we can go and introduce them. Um, so maybe I could start with um, uh, Bill Bullen from Utilita, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Utilita. Utilita is uh, one of the new entrant energy companies um, focused on delivering smart prepay services. And consequently, we have um, over the, well, the highest um, smart meter penetration in the country, over 90% of our customers. But probably more importantly, we also have over 65% of our customers um, engaged with us on a digital basis, which I think is also the highest in the industry. So about 800,000 customers in total. Okay, thanks, Bill. And Bob, uh, you're the one that I can hear. Maybe you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Taylor. I'm the CEO of Portsmouth Water, hopefully uh, a name that many in this region will recognize as a company that's been around for about 160 years, delivering um, uh, top quality water supplies in the uh, Portsmouth and uh, surrounding areas. Uh, obviously we are um, very close to environmental matters, being a water company, our business relies on us um, uh, taking water from the natural environment and then returning it after it runs through the uh, the cycle of usage. So I'm very interested to tell you about the uh, developments that are happening both in our company and in our sector this morning. Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, and um, Helen, I can see you there. Could you introduce yourself quickly, please? Yep, sure. I'm Helen McNair. I've worked in the food industry for about 35 years uh, in manufacturing and retail, looking after quality and food safety. Um, I currently work for Lionel Hitchin, which are a food flavouring ingredient uh, manufacturer, and we buy raw materials from all over the world, citrus, herbs and spices. Um, my social and responsibility sort of involvement really started with ethical audits in Africa in the 1990s. 
Um, and I'm just generally passionate about sustainability and found myself leading a lot of the initiatives at Lionel Hitchin. Great. I'm delighted to say that I, I heard that, um, Helen, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> Liana, uh, perhaps you could introduce yourself, please. Welcome. Of course. Thank you, Bob. Good morning. Uh, my name's Liana Leakes. I'm the Operations Director at Red Funnel. I've been in the shipping industry for just over 20 years, and obviously we work within the marine environment um, and align with the clean maritime plan. There's a lot happening in our industry as we move towards that idea of net zero for 2050. So it'll be interesting to chat to what we're doing in our industry and hopefully learn from the other panel members as well. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, I think it's to Mark Smith. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, please. Yep. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, I'm Mark. And uh, as we say, I'm, I head up um, Southern Co-op. So we run a chain of convenience stores across the south, switching sort of from Kent across to Devon, a couple of hundred convenience stores and also a funeral home business uh, and a franchised coffee business. Yes. Uh, my career has been in retail, always had a strong interest and commitment uh, yeah, around yeah. sustainability and those issues. So um, we're keen to talk to share with you today some of our perspectives, uh, but also uh, my involvement with business in the community, the Prince's Responsible Business Trust, where I sit on the uh, Southeast Advisory Board for that. So I hope you can give a slightly different perspective as well from uh, from that involvement this morning. So great to be here. Thank great. you for the invite. Great, fantastic. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing that. So maybe just to get started. So one thing that I, I observe in my role is that even though there are, there are common themes between businesses and, and sectors, sustainability can mean different things for, for businesses. So maybe if we just explore among some of our panelists what sustainability means for your business. And uh, Liana, perhaps I could start with, with you, please, and just give, give your take on that. Yeah, of course, Rob. So for us, in the past, we've heavily focused on the environmental elements of sustainability. Um, and we've been really successful in that and made significant progress through our Red Funnel Goes Green strategy um just really focused on air pollution waste management recycling energy reduction um and then our, our more of our corporate responsibility with the isle of Wight that we support so we've been operating at crystal Lent since um the 1860s so we've got a long history there we are synonymous with travel to the isle of Wight, but there are options for our customers so now we're really focusing on protecting the environment that we work within. And through that, we don't just mean the green element and working towards carbon zero. It really, for us, is giving ethical choices <coughs> for our consumers and our customers, because it's becoming no longer acceptable to be a carbon hungry business or um, to not invest in the environment that you're working in, support the island that we um, are a lifeline service for. So I think for us, it's something that's progressing. It's I'm not saying we've got the plan to get us to net zero. That's very much our focus for the next few years. But for us, it's bringing value, identifying steps in that value chain <coughs> that we make ethical choices about the way we operate. Okay, thank you. So again, it, it, environment's a big part of it, but there's, there's other factors as well, which I think you, you've touched upon there. And Helen, I know you've got a slightly a slightly different take again in, in the sector that you're in and maybe 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 some insights from you about how you've looked to embed sustainability within your business because i know when we spoke before that was a, an important thing for, uh, mm -hmm. for you yeah i mean the sustainability in the food industry really started 30 years ago almost entirely about ethical issues um mm -hmm. there was some big uh, media attention around some commodities, tea, coffee, cocoa, about the very bad ethical conditions, working conditions that people were working under, badly paid. Um, so questions were being asked by consumers about you know, where their food was coming from. And so brands and manufacturers, the retailers had to be asking those questions down the supply chain. Um, and some brand owners and manufacturers realized there was an opportunity there actually to create a market for fairly traded products so things like fair trade green and blacks and all of those those brands were set up and and develop markets for themselves um, and so that's really where the sustainability journey started in the um, food industry but more recently the environment has become more important and climate change has directly impacted lionel hitchin We've had two fairly recent incidences where our supply chain has been completely disrupted um, by climate events. Uh, a, a product in the Caribbean um, 
has just stopped being available because it was wiped out by the horrendous uh, tornadoes and, and hurricanes out there. And the floods in Kerala a few years ago also disrupted our supply um, with transportation not being able to get in and out of the processes, crops being damaged and employees' homes just being completely destroyed. So we're seeing real impacts of climate change and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really important point, isn't it? Sometimes when we think about climate change or as a bank climate risk, you know, we think about the two elements, you know, physical and transition risk, and we tend to think that transition risk is the, the only one that matters here in the UK because of mm. yeah, the climate, the, the physical risk might not be that great, but of course, yeah, we've all got huge supply chains and our supply chain sits in countries which will be impacted. So I think your example there speaks to that perfectly. Thank you. Um, and maybe Mark, if, if I could, I think again you've got slightly a slightly different take on sustainability. Maybe more about the, well, I, mean, I think, I think um, Helen also mentioned as well, but a little bit about the the consumer side as well and some of their expectations. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I mean that's that's a feature of our world. Obviously, um, dealing directly with about one and a half million people a week come to the doors of our shops. So. You know, the insight that we get increasingly from those people and from the research that, that we and others in the industry do, you know, says this topic is going up the agenda of those customers, you know, very, very rapidly. Uh, and it's really important, I think, for an industry that retail is able to keep ahead of that and to be you know, meeting the, the aspirations that those customers have uh, in this field. So whilst, whilst it's convenience and price are, are, are still the top issues for customers, you know, this, this subject is coming up rapidly alongside it. And... Uh, it's important that we respond to that and start to address things. And some of those things we have already touched on in the other comments, but you know, for us, there's also things around the waste agenda. You know, we, we got to a zero to landfill position several years ago, and now with, with the rest of our industry, in fairness, you know, grappling with issues of food waste and, and getting that further down, dealing with packaging and some of these issues, which are you know everyday things, and I think gives the opportunity for the subject to, to really resonate with, with regular people in a day-to-day -day way you know it's not a technical subject when it comes down to throwing away edible food or or having too much plastic in the supply chain it's things that everyone can relate to and uh, obviously the work that, that David Attenborough did in the last few years has propelled that whole agenda massively so you know we want to harness that and get some momentum behind it as part of that yeah yeah thank you fantastic um so that's really, really interesting. So we've got three similar but slightly different takes on sustainability and the different um, uh, the different impacts or the different considerations in different different sectors. But maybe you could bring bring in some of our other panelists just to think about you know what's been done on sustainability so far in their respective businesses. You know, it's, there's more focus on sustainability now, but it's been around for for many years, uh, either as a, a specific strategy or as a, a policy within a business. So, Bill, maybe I could bring you in at, at this stage to talk about what what you've done at Utilita on sustainability over the last few years, and, and maybe you could also just talk about you know what are the important things for your business on around sustainability as well, if you could. Yeah, sure. Well, I think um, the energy industry has obviously been decarbonising for quite some time. I think back in 1990, you know, we were burning something like 80 million tons of coal in power stations. Um, this year, um, I don't know what it's going to be, but we'll certainly have days where we don't burn any coal at all. Um, so that's been a huge change. Um, and there's also a, a big government initiative called the Renewables Obligation, which basically requires all suppliers to deliver 50% of the energy that they deliver to residential customers coming from um, renewable sources. So that's you know, those are the, probably the two biggest things that have really driven down um, UK carbon emissions. In Utilita, Specifically, I mean, we're a supply company. We buy energy, we sell energy. So our, you know, actual emissions for utility are actually relatively low. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I think, um, you know, it, we still have to take a, we've, we've, we've published a, a very clear st statement about achieving net zero. Um, and the first stage of that was to actually map out where our emissions are coming from. So looking upstream and downstream, as well as what we're doing ourselves. And there's a, a standard um, corporate um, accounting and reporting standard from the uh, greenhouse gas protocol that helps people do that. Um, and we've we've mapped out ours now. As I say, we're on a, a strategy to uh, achieve net zero by 2030. Um, I think we, you know, fairly clear about the first few years about you know where we're going to be going. Um, 
but I think it's you know it's important also to maintain some flexibility for the longer term. Um, I think the other thing that we, is really important for us as a business is that um, you know we're a prepaid company, so you know without putting too fine a point, like we're dealing with an awful lot of low income households. So um, cost effectiveness is is absolutely critical. Um, and one of the, the cheapest ways to reduce CO2 emissions is through behavior change, education and behavior change. Um, so we've had an initiative called the Energy High Five, which is all about um, helping customers to reduce their energy consumption, um, as I say, through education and through achieving behavioral change, which you know, I think those are really important factors. We've seen um, a massive behavioural change as a consequence of COVID because, you know, here we all are sitting in our homes rather than going to an office. And that's a whole load of commuting energy that's um, disappeared. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, a, a good thing. If you're going to get some positives out of the current situation, that's one of them. Yep, agreed. Agreed. Um, it's obviously slightly easier to deal with the technology when you're in the same room as, as we've just seen. But yes, I agree. Um, it does have its downsides. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Bob, I could, I could bring you you in at this point. Um, uh, again, a similar question to Bill. Really, you know, you know what, 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 what's a, what, what have your what's your business done on sustainability to date, and maybe just your your take on what sustainability means for um, uh, for you. Well, um, uh, being in a utility business as well, there were some some parallels with um, um, what we just heard a moment ago, but. Um, uh, I think in our sector, there are many, many dimensions to sustainability, of course, but um, perhaps what I'm going to focus on is the sustainability of the service that we provide, you know, our fundamental provision of drinking water to customers' taps and, um, uh, and treatment of that, putting it back into the environment. Um, I think we've been active for a long time in this space as as an industry that's very sort of side by side with the natural environment. So the sort of things are um, about uh, installing renewable uh, power generation facilities, sourcing grid power from sustainable sources um, uh, and so on. But probably the biggest challenge and ongoing challenge for us um, as a sector that's already feeling the impact of climate change quite significantly um, is to try to get the message across to our customers because um, uh, we all have a role to play in this. And um, uh, whilst there is still uh, some, there is still so, there is some um, awareness of the impact of water consumption on the natural environment, and we're trying to encourage our customers to be as water efficient as possible. There's still uh, a way to go on that. Uh, as a country, we are not particularly water efficient. Um, within the country, there are there are pockets of water efficiency where water is scarce. You might say in in the southeast to a large degree, and um, in the East Anglian region. Um, and metering has been vital for the industry in um, in facilitating. Uh, reduced usage of water using mainly what I would call economic levers. People just become more conscious of the amount of water that they use if they know they are paying for it by, vo by volume, and um, and that stimulates behaviour change, as we as we spoke about a moment ago. Uh, in our in our case, as Portsmouth Water, we have been a little bit of an oasis in the southeast sort of um, uh, water stressed region historically, but where we find ourselves now is in a position of having to use our plentiful supply to support our neighboring companies um, because of the need to um, to reduce abstraction from the chalk streams in the region, for example, to uh, allow the ecology to recover from over abstraction historically. Um, and um, we need to, we, 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 we haven't sought a, a deep penetration of meters for our customers as other water companies have in the region because of, of us historically having water availability, but that is now changing. And of course, with the um, digital revolution, those meters are set to be smart meters, which are uh, inevitably more useful and more powerful in conveying information to customers about their consumption patterns and helping them to, to change behavior. So. Um, 
for us as a, as a relatively small player in the UK water sector, I would say um, the route to uh, carbon neutrality and sustainability is has changed massively uh, in the last two or three years and, and will continue to change. Um, as an industry, I think we're one of the only industries in the world actually to come together as a sector in the UK and commit to carbon neutrality by 2030. Uh, so as a, as a trade association at Water UK level, we have uh, produced a route map for that and all of the individual companies within the sector are now planning their own contribution to that. But it's more of the things that um, I've spoken about already in terms of um, the way that you source your power, either locally through your own green generation or perhaps in other green ways from the grid. It's about uh, fleet electrification. But most of all, it is about making sure that our customers understand the need to be careful with the water that they use and the impact that excessive use has uh, on the environment. Uh, and going back to the COVID point made earlier as well, we have seen in our sector a um, uh, probably in round figures across the industry, five to ten percent increase in consumption over the last year with with lockdown, which has effectively put back our plans to to reduce individual uh, per capita usage and Im improve water efficiency. So the starting point for that has suddenly. Uh, increased by five to ten percent. We're not sure how much of that will be permanent. I think most businesses are talking about a, a hybrid way of working moving forward. So that probably implies that there will be a certain amount of um, uh, implicit sort of residual long-term increase. But um, uh, yeah, we, we, we're fighting against the COVID tide as well as um, uh, uh, other other factors. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And maybe. Maybe I can just follow up with a quick question, Bobby, if you don't mind. You mentioned some of the initiatives around renewables and, and smart metering. And so, something that I I'm so often ask, you know, is sustainability just a cost? Uh, you know, how, how do you view that at, at Porcelain's Water? Is it, is it a cost or a necessity or an opportunity uh, for you? No, I, I, th I think it's, it's much more than a cost because um, it comes down to the the fundamental environment in which we live. It comes down to the earth in which we live at the end of the day and preserving yeah. that for, for future generations. Uh, I mean, we, if you're talking about cost, we, uh, I mentioned, you know, we, with metering, sometimes there is a, an economic impact. There are uh, behavior changes that come as a result of people being aware of that they're paying by, by volume and not just a fixed charge. Uh, our water prices in Portsmouth are the lowest in the country. Our average bill a year, um, which um, which is is um, way down on the next lowest uh, in our sector, and and way down on en energy uh, costs, for example. So for us, we don't have that economic leverage really because the charges are so low, um, and in many ways, people would argue that water is is undervalued as a commodity. So what we have to do is that we have to focus on that hearts and minds thing. We have to get people to understand the environmental impacts and the um, uh, the fact that we are talking now about the planet that we are leaving behind for the generations that follow ahead of us, because only in doing that will people then consider their behaviours and change. So <laughs> cost is a small part of it, in my view. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, and maybe just to finish, maybe um, uh, Mark, if I could bring you back in again, just about again looking back at what's been done to date. I think one thing, one thing that we found at HSBC is how important it is to bring in um, all their employees on this on this journey. So we've you know, we've recruited across the business around 500 what we call sustainable finance ambassadors who were trained in, in sustainable finance, so they can speak to their clients about about this topic, which we think is really important. And I think, Mark, maybe you've got a bit, a bit of insight uh, around your business and what's been done around the workforce um, to, to kind of embed it within the business. Yeah, absolutely, I have. And just just before that, though, just to just to pick up mm. on, on what Bob was saying there in terms of the cost, you know, I think mm. clearly there is a cost, but you have to see that cost as an investment and an investment in the future resilience of the the business at the micro level and you know and as bob said the planet as a whole at the macro level so 
if, if the macro piece fails, there's no business plan for anyone. So I think, you know, you have to recognize costs, but see it as an yep. investment. And yep. actually part of the return on that investment is really uh, the, the knock-on effect onto the, the teams that work with us. And, you know, we've experienced, and I know through my involvement with the ITC, others have experienced a massive potential plus for workforces when they're when their co- the companies and their firms start to get behind this agenda because you know it, it is something which many many people have a strong passion for and particularly but not exclusively you know people at the lower end of the age spectrum and certainly the further down that age spectrum you go the more the passion is there so there's a real opportunity i think to harness some of that and we've been working quite hard in in ways we we, we um call them energy champions, you call them uh, ambassadors, it's the same sort of thing. But I think you know, taking that one step at a time, but actually in a business like ours, where we employ a lot of people in uh, a number of locations, many of them, you know, uh, entry level jobs, the energy which is behind this that people have shown is incredible. Uh, and I think, and I know the view within business in the community is that it's a great opportunity for companies of all types to harness that energy at all levels in the workforce. You know, build the employer brand as part of that at a time when recruiting and retaining talent is is ever more difficult. But also potentially galvanize that that um, volume of people to take this agenda out of the business and into communities, into people's homes. Um, and you know, one of the things that we've been talking about in BITC is if if you can harness a bit of that coming out of the workplace, that energy and, and positivity around this agenda. Uh, and as, as Bob was saying, you know, people having to do some things in their own home as part of it. If we could do that from a business perspective, alongside perhaps from education, it's massively powerful around, you know, the home kitchen table of an evening. And that's where it starts to get traction even beyond companies. And that for me is a really exciting part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. absolutely agree with that. Um, did, did somebody want to come in there? Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say, we've... Um, we created a policy because we were finding there were there was what we what people were doing around the business was quite fragmented. There were the engineers who were sort of changing electric um, bulbs, putting in motion sensors. Our HR team were looking after sort of the ethical issues. Our environmental and safety manager, health and safety manager, was sorting out the waste to make sure nothing was going to waste. So we developed a policy really to encompass everything that everybody was doing to give them a sense of purpose and direction. And we really started to get our employees involved sort of through various management teams and committees. And we, we unleashed latent passion in people. And we've set up a, a, a green dream team. Um, and, and those individuals are sort of using the Lionel Hitch and Facebook network to sort of talk to other people in the business and their teams. And uh, it's amazing how much momentum we've gathered really in a very short time by by involving our employees and the excitement and the buzz around the business is fantastic. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, no, that's uh, absolutely resonates. I think every, everybody on the panel is, is nodding. You know, we, we find it here because <laughs> everyone's nodding here. Um, and we hear it from our yeah, when we, we're looking to uh, recruit, you know, it's one of the one of the questions that we're asked as an organisation uh, around sustainability. Mm. So it's, it's really important yeah, that we're all absolutely. we're all uh, we're all um, on top of this uh, topic and, and showing leadership. So we've we've talked about sustainability, looked at the past, and maybe maybe we can just look forward a little bit. Um, yeah, there is more and more focus on sustainability. Um, the expectations of all our stakeholders, whether it's uh, uh, customers or shareholders or governments, seem to be increasing. I think that's that's probably true. Uh, the transition to net zero is going to be a huge focus over the next few years. It's going to it's going to require, well, in my view, you know, changes to business models. Maybe even new business models are going to going to emerge, and a huge amount of investment. So with that context, looking forward, um, you know, maybe Bill, if I could bring you in again, you know, how, how are you sort of looking forward over the next few years uh, within Utility? What, what are the opportunities and things that you're looking at? Oh, well, I think it's a really exciting time in the energy sector. You know, there are, uh, I guess, several brands that are really, you know, grasping this opportunity. And it is an opportunity because... Um, there's so much, uh, you know, new technology that's available um, that's helping us to reduce uh, carbon emissions and also reduce cost at the same time. You know, 
So it, this is definitely a you know a business opportunity, and I think for us as a business, we you know we definitely don't want to be seen in the future as being a you know irresponsible, dirty supplier. Um, at the same time, as I said earlier on, we do have to worry about um, affordability, and that's you know um, critical for us. But I guess also there's the thing that really excites me about the future is that the extent to which um, decisions on reducing um, greenhouse gases are, are essentially being socialized by the technology that's becoming available. Um, and you can think of that for everything from, you know, LED lighting, which I think, you know, everybody's um, all over these days, but um, also things like solar panels, electric vehicles. Um, but then again, you know, I think we'd be missing a trick if you just swap your petrol car for an electric vehicle. You should, you know, consider other modes of transport. And, you know, I know electric scooters are a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Um, not everybody likes them. But, you know, there's just a huge amount of uh, technology that's being made available, which, you know, for me, um, you know, it's it's very exciting. Um, certainly the energy sector is going to completely transform over the next decade. Um, I'm absolutely certain of that. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And um, technology is going to play a huge part in that, isn't it? You know, Bill, if you sort of think about, um, you know, how EVs are going to going to charge and how they fit in with the grid, you know, technology has yeah. got such a huge part to play. There are probably a, a couple of things where, you know, there are, I guess, more difficult issues. And I think that's around, um, you know, the electrification of heating and uh, hot water. But I think even those, you know, Technologies are coming along. Heat pumps are, you know, one option, but you know, we'll probably increasingly see hot water storage coming, you know, direct from a solar panel. You know, there's all kinds of opportunities and options that are going to come out of the woodwork over the next decade. So, um, yeah, it's it's an exciting one. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Bill. And I, I guess one thing that um, I see in my role, speaking to to corporates, uh, I've seen many more uh, large corporates starting to set medium and um, even long-term targets around sustainability yeah i mentioned hsbc's on targets earlier in the um early in, in, the, in the webinar and other banks <laughs> have, have similar targets as well so maybe leanne i could i could bring you in because i know that's something you're looking at, at right now and you know how how you set those targets and, and uh, how you benchmark them as well yeah, thank you. I think for shipping, as in our industry, you know, we are responsible for 2.9% of the world's uh, man-made carbon emissions. So the IMO set us a target of 2050 to reduce them by 50%. Um, and then within the UK, we've got the Clean Maritime that has net zero at the heart of it, again, for 2050. So we've got ambitious targets. And I think for us, picking up on the themes of others, it's exciting. It is a huge opportunity for us to um bring forward that technology be involved with other companies i think for us it's got to be some kind of um, partnership or coalition because as a small business who provide a lifeline service it's essential we operate so while we want to be innovative and mm -hmm. and be at the forefront of that we also need tried and tested technology so we're we're looking to replace our fleet in the next uh, five to ten years so a big part of our our strategy or our, our business plan is what that replacement is going to look like um, and we're we're keen to work with um, manufacturers and shipping and a shipyard to produce something that's wholly and solely British something we can be proud of so for us I think you've touched on it as well if we can get our our tech team um, involved and our shore operations teams involved in what the shore infrastructure looks like then to support that vessel that secures our future not just the next five to ten years but vessels last 30 years so it's, it's exciting, but slightly daunting to make sure we get the right technology. Um, as I say, we're doing a full fleet replacement in the next five to 10 years. So there's great opportunities for us there. Um, the, the fuel and the port infrastructure is one of the things that we're gonna find a challenge um, because as we are replacing, the technology is not necessarily there within the shore infrastructure to support us. So if we go for a full electrification, do we go for a battery hybrid now and then look perhaps to retrofit for a hydrogen fuel, depending on what comes to, to the Solent area? These are questions or challenges for us to get over. Because if we build a ship and we can't get the supply there of the hydrogen, then that's really clearly not going to work for us. So it's about working with the partners in industry infrastructure, as well as um, our customers. We have a great opportunity here to continue the work that we do with our corporate social responsibility in uh, supporting the Isle of Wight to actually work with them and ask our customers what they want and what's really important to them. 
So again, lots of great opportunities to work with the island as well as our colleagues internally as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, as, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm just thinking actually, an investment is in a, in a vessel is, is a long-term investment, isn't it? It's not like investing in a, I don't know, a, um, uh, an EV or something, which is a 10-year investment. You know, this is a long-term yeah. investment. So how, how, how are you sort of looking at, at that? Because the decisions you make now are going to be with you for, for a number of years. They are, I think, you, I mean, you made some really good points. Electric vehicles we've done with our tugs within our port areas, um, simple things within our buildings, replacing lamps, that, those smaller things, lots of small things have made a difference. But now as go forward, this is a huge investment. And for a business of our size, we, we have to get that right. We're looking at approximately a 40 million pound investment in a vessel. Um, and that vessel, that asset then lasts us for hopefully 30 years, but it's trying to future-proof that as well. And we're almost building too early because some of the infrastructure is not yet there to say, give us the hydrogen power that we need in the Southampton area, or um, we'll call it cold ironing, but electric, you know, plugging the, the vessels in while they're alongside giving us some of the power. So I think we're looking at a battery hybrid solution. But some of the bigger players in our industry, if you think of Stena, they're committed to a fully electrified ferry by 2030. So Stena Electra is due out in 2030. So there, it is happening, it is coming in our industry. But again, for us as a smaller business, it's, it's trying to make those choices um, that are that are sustainable, that ensure we are sustainable, that we're still here for the next 160 years to continue to support the Isle of Wight. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Helen, Helen, maybe I could bring you in again on this topic of setting sort of medium term targets. I know you've got some some insights on that from your perspective. Yeah, yeah, luckily we don't have such massive investments as Leanna does <laughs> with Red Funnel. Um, but we've created what we've called a green pathway. We didn't want like the road, the term roadmap because it, it had connotations with cars. So we've created a green pathway and a lot of the ideas on that green pathway have come from the employees when we were asking them for and ideas to save energy um, and it's been a way for us to really evaluate some of the ideas and work out where we need to invest time and resource and money and what's going to give us the biggest um, sort of impact for from an environmental point of view and from a, a cost point of view and a cost saving point of view and how, what's going to cost the most and how we can stagger that investment as well um, so we, we've developed this green pathway and that will help um, sort of work through our plans and be able to evaluate the impact that they're having. So reporting through KPIs and those sorts of things and, and give a clear plan to our customers as well about what we're, we're hoping to do. So that's the sort of approach that we've taken um, to, to think about how we're going to manage the future and the investments that we're making and the, and the time that we're putting into this. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned KPIs there. Uh... Helen, so the, these are the sustainability key performance indicators. Mm. Maybe, maybe you just you just sort of share some insight with every, everyone on the call. How how are you identifying which are your KPIs in your in your business? Yeah, certainly. So uh, energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions is obviously one. Um, we're also uh, supplying that information to the Food and Drink Federation because as a, as a, as a trade organisation, we've made commitments to the government about energy reduction that as an industry we're going to do. I think the food and drink industry contributes about 5%, uh, uh, is about fifth in terms of the manufacturing sector in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so very significant in terms of that. So the Food and Drink Federation have been working with the government to work out our participation as a trade towards net zero. Um, so energy and greenhouse gas, gas emissions is, is the one thing, but we'll also be looking at, at waste. We don't have any waste going to landfill at the moment, but we also want to try and reduce our waste. So those have been the key things at the moment um, that we're looking at. Uh, in the future, we will have to look at water usage. I'm <laughs> probably pleased to know. Uh, we will have to start making sure that, you know, we're, we're being um, resourceful with how we're using water. Um, it's it's an ingredient, but also we use it for cleaning and that sort of thing. So we do need to to look at that in the future. So that will be what will set our KPIs and and our targets and measures. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And um, Bob, I'm going to come back to you actually in a moment. Something I, I didn't say. I, I don't know if it was said at, said at the beginning when when I couldn't hear the call. But there is a, a Q and A uh, functionality available. So please do submit your questions. We'll uh, give ten minutes at the end to to go through them. Um, so Bob, maybe I could come 
to you just on this point again. You, you've talked about how you have uh, an ambition of carbon neutrality, neutrality across the industry by by 2030. I think you mentioned, um, yeah, which is which is fantastic. But maybe you could give some insight. You know, what are you thinking as ports ports of water looking forward? Some of the maybe targets or initiatives that you're looking at over the next next few years. Yeah, I, th I think. Um... There's a good reason why we've um, we've done this as an industry, which I'll I'll come on to in a moment. But um, certainly for us, um, it, it's more of the things that we've been doing already, um, to a large degree. Things like um, like green energy and sourcing our external energy in a green way. We've, we were we're already doing that, but we we're expanding our in investment in solar. Um, probably the biggest area will be uh, a massive rollout um, over over which will go beyond 2030 of metering. So around about 35% of our domestic customers at the moment are metered, and those are typically customers who have asked to have a meter because they think that that's better for them from a cost point of view. Uh, so that leaves 65% uh, who are very happy with just paying an annual fixed price. So um, those are the, uh, th that's the population base that we have to um, kind of help to support and educate in terms of the contribution they can make by having a meter and using that as much as, uh, you know, as, as much to measure the water that you use but, uh, as to help you um, understand your water using behavior and how, how you can improve that. So I think that's that's really important. Um, just two important other things I would mention as well. As an industry, the reason why we've chosen neutrality as an industry is because water and sewage companies are in a stronger position than water only companies like ourselves because they have um, wastewater treatment facilities and these have the ability to actually generate power through the um, a process of anaerobic digestion for disposal of sludge on um, wastewater treatment plants. And that, that enables a green source of power to be made available um, with a surplus injected into the grid. So, um, uh, and, and, and some of our water and sewage company colleagues are well advanced down that track already so not only would they be neutral but they would be um, you know generating green energy and generating uh, positivity in that way so uh, that, that's an important point the other thing I would say is that there, there's also a massive effort in, across our industry in the UK going on which I suppose is a subset of you know the government's desire for us to be leaders in the UK in in dealing with climate change, um, uh, on, on innovation and research and development. So, for example, water companies now have targets for leakage reduction, uh, which is a very important component of, of you know, using water efficiently. And to get to those targets over the next 10 years, we know that the technology that we have today is not going to be sufficient. We know that we need to find new ways and new techniques to um, uh, to pinpointing and repairing leaks efficiently because the lower the leakage goes, the more the residual leakage is comprised of very, very small little weeps and, uh, and joint leaks that are very uh, difficult to find and very um, expensive to repair. So um, leakage is just but one example of uh, uh, many, many areas where uh, we are looking to develop. And another area perhaps is finding green solutions to uh, water quality problems, for example. So rather than building end of pipe, concrete and steel water treatment plants that uh, are designed to remove uh, uh, contaminants from the water, uh, we work in the environment, we work with landowners, we work with farmers to try to stop that stuff going into the water in the first place, particularly um, pesticides and nitrates, which are used um, throughout agriculture. So, um, yeah, ma massive this recognition that to get us where we want to get to in the next seven or eight years, there is also a lot of R&D effort that needs to go in to support that. Yep, yep. No, I agree with that. And, and listen, I love, I love the idea of, of using resources within the business to, be, to sort of close that circularity loop. So your example there on using sewage to create electricity is fantastic. I was at a farm yesterday. Where, 
you know, they're thinking about using the, you know, the, the biomass that comes off their, their, their farm to do exactly that, to create the electricity, create the heat that then can go back into the, to the greenhouse. I think it's such an important, an important point. So yeah. conscious of time, we've got four minutes for our last question and then we've got um, five minutes of Q&A. So we've talked a lot about some of the changes uh, that are required to, to reach net zero and to be more sustainable and some of the commitments that some of the businesses uh, on the call today are making around that. The really ambitious aims and some of these technologies and business business models are going to need going to need support. They're in their, some are in their infancy and they're going to require a lot of investment. So, just interested on some views of that external support that we think you know, might be helpful. Um, I mean, maybe Bill, maybe I could come to, to yourself. I know you've got um, you've got a, a, a view on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess there's two uh, areas of support. One is from government, and we've definitely seen the government taking action. For me, you know, going forward, I think with all of the, you know, diversity of um, technologies that we've been talking about, I think the governments can't carry on micromanaging to the extent that they have. So I definitely like to see the government take on a, you know, a much broader brush approach through something like a carbon tax um, and, you know, essentially make it a lot easier to make decisions that are going to reduce um, CO2 by giving everybody a, an overwhelming commercial incentive. So that would be kind of the, the thing I'd be looking for from government. But again, I think, you know, the exciting bit is the extent to which, um, you know, people can now decarbonize, you know, every aspect of their life, not just their energy, but, um, you know, your pair of trainers you've just bought or the meal you've just um, gone out and had. And, you know, there are, um, assets out there now. Um, one in particular is a thing called the Ireland in Index, which basically um, helps to express CO2 emissions on a uh, basis of you know, per pound of retail expenditure. So virtually everything you can buy, um, you can estimate the CO2 emission from. And I think that's you know just in the same way as people draw a real connection when they're buying energy, whether it's gas, electricity, or fuel for their car, between you know, buying that energy and, and thinking about the emissions, they will also be able to draw a line that will you know help them you know visualize the amount of uh, CO2 emissions that they're causing from all the other aspects of you know things that they spend money on, uh, because you know the vast majority of money is spent on you know all kinds of other things. So. Um, you know, I think it's it's really important that those those assets are available and they are out there, and you know, for people to use. And to, we are starting to see that. You know, um, restaurants are starting to put <laughs> the CO two emissions on the bottom of the bill as well as the service charge. Um, and you know, certainly uh, some retailers are starting to put the you know the CO two content of the goods they're selling you, uh, so you can you know form a you know, much more holistic view of your carbon footprint, which I think is is really exciting. Yep. Yeah, that's a that's a nice vision, isn't it? Where we can all make choices when we when we buy things or purchase things around the, the carbon emissions associated with it. That should that should you'd think that would drive real real change. Um, I mean, Mark, we, we, uh, Bill's talked a little bit about government there. Um, I, I, know, I know we spoke earlier, and you've got you've got uh, some views around you know, how government can play can play their role in in this this transition. Yeah. Yeah, very much as a framework, I think, and you know, I totally support the view that you know you don't want too much micromanaging, uh, and there's been lots of well-intended initiatives that have not landed well, you know, from that reason. So I think it's more about infrastructure, and if I give you an example from our world, which is really quite an important one, which is around the recycling agenda, and clearly, you know, a lot of work's been done in the industry. There's a lot of demand from consumers to be able to recycle more of the packaging. Uh, and yet still across the country, there's a real mismatch of provision uh, at local authority level as to what can be collected curbside, what can be recycled readily and in what combinations. It's an absolute you know, minefield of complexity and difficulty. So I think there's a role for, you know, for government of whatever variety to just simplify some of that and work alongside what the industry is doing in that case to, to get less plastic in the system to start with, which of course is the big win. But it can never be none. So, you know, whatever is left in there needs to be able to be recycled easily. And a lot of this is about making it easy for people. So just as, you know, as a retailer, we want to make it easy for people to buy sustainable products. And uh, Leah mentioned fair trade earlier, obviously, in co-op, we've been championing that for many years. Those sort of products, local products, you know, we sell a lot of tomatoes on the Isle of Wight, from the Isle of Wight. Uh, and we want to keep promoting that sort of thing. But ultimately, the, the, the end of the journey of that product 
will involve an element of recycling that's still nothing like as good as it could be. So I think there's a big, a big opportunity there uh, for them. Um, and at a much more macro level still, I, I think the whole uh, generation agenda is one that's uh, power of generation is still a massive hole, really, because we're getting all the impetus towards more and more electrification. And all I see is power stations closing, not opening. So <laughs> I, I think that's something the government still needs to focus on. But business generally, and with BITC, we've seen you know more and more, we've heard it today, haven't we? More and more collaboration between businesses, and that's a great opportunity. Uh, and I really think you know there's, there's more power probably in trade bodies and groups of companies coming together, working with organizations like business in the community. Uh, you know, that will bring a lot of it to life. And then the government provides the framework and makes it easy for business and, and consumers. And that, that will be a good join up. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, isn't it? I think collaboration between businesses is really important in, in particular sectors, particularly when you're thinking about supply chain, when you've got many, very many small companies in a supply chain, all of whom need, need to make similar uh, changes and choices. Yeah, I think collaboration mm -hmm. is, is really important in that, in that context. Um, we're out of time. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm going to risk one more question before before Q and A because I'd like to bring uh, the idea of finance as a as an enable into into this. So maybe maybe Helen, I could I could come back to you if I could. I know, I know you've got some thoughts around the sort of financial support and funding that's that's available and how that could be made a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're lucky in terms of our business. We're you know we're doing okay financially. We don't need to be uh, looking for lots of funding to support some of the work that we're doing. But um, I, I think the government grants that are available aren't very visible. You know, I, I came across the fact that you could get uh, grants for installing electric vehicle charging points almost by accident, and I think that's that that's a key thing if the government really want us to start doing taking action about this they need to at least make the availability of these grants more more visible um, you know you can't expect small businesses to create massive dossiers to justify why they they uh, can apply for these grants and those sorts of things and when it comes to taxes and penalties which almost certainly they will be implementing in the future they need to make them straightforward um, you know that the uh, Mark just talked there about the the uh, packaging. You know, they're talking about packaging taxes, and you know, it, it's just so complicated. And the Food and Drink Federation are, are looking at it and trying to work with government to make it easy about who actually pays the tax. And uh, you know, they, they need to make it more simple. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I think it's time to go to Q and A. So at this stage, I'm going to ask. Uh, Richard Dibden, who's the commercial director at CMA Recruitment, I think he's going to moderate the q a hopefully if you enjoying the panel hi richard hi rob thanks very much uh yeah we're going to okay? finish off there. yeah i can hear you can you hear me yep yeah great um so we're just going to finish off with a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience We've got uh, six or eight minutes to go i'd say so um first question uh from stephen cooper is uh, what is the biggest contributor to success in creating a sustainable business? Uh, and, and linked to that, should this be a top-down initiative? Maybe if I can uh, come to uh, Liana. Yeah. That one. Oh. yeah, of course. Um, I think the, the key element for me is to be clear on who you are, be clear as a business on who you are and what matters to you and your customers. And then... From that, choose the aspects that are important to you and your customers, and then really focus on them. Because if you look at the UN sustainability goals, there's 17 of those, and you could drill down into each one and come up with six or seven points for each. So it's about picking the core things that are really important and focusing on them for you and your business. Great. Uh, Bill, do you have something to, to add there? Uh uh, to be honest, I think it's just been said. Uh, you know, I think the key thing is is leadership. Be clearing about clear about what your values are as you know as a business, and um, you know that just gets you know everybody aligned in the business staff and everybody. So, agree with that. Great. Okay. It's it's about where you can genuinely. I was sorry. I was just going to say it's it's about where you can genuinely have an impact, and identifying that too. And also also being honest and transparent with your customers. I should add as well because I think there's an awful lot. Certainly, in my industry, unfortunately, is what we call greenwash. Uh, it's a it's a real problem, and I think um, you know that's actually starts to come out, and it's kind of being exposed a bit now. So, but I think you know being open and transparent is absolutely. Well, just to add to, 
just sorry, just to add to that, I guess it's from that point, it's making sure it's measurable and you can track it and then share yeah. the results of your progress. So exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, another question I think was it was largely covered by the, the funding uh, aspect of the, that we did there at the end. But um, I guess paraphrasing one of the other questions is um, what what sort of what, would you expect those some of these costs be passed to the consumer? Uh, and, and if so, uh, what, what what is a sort of a, a fair percentage to be passed down? Mark, can I? I think <laughs> sure. Um, well, I, I guess the general principle applies that very little of the costs generally end up getting passed to the consumer. So I think you know the the point with this whole agenda is it needs to be mainstream, doesn't it, and not be you know something different and, and uh, attached to the side of a business. So it's just another uh, piece of, of doing business, another part of the business model and a cost model that has to be absorbed. And I think there's a job for all of us to amend our structures, amend the way we do business to be able to suck up, you know, certainly most of that. I mean, that's what happens generally in supply chains, isn't it? And if we think of, you know, the effects of Brexit and other things, that's that's had to be absorbed. And I guess this is a bit like that. Um, it can't be heavily inflationary. It, it, that just won't wash. So it comes back to the innovation point, I think, that was made earlier and finding slightly different ways to do things. Uh, but also, as I said, you know, being very slick with the things that we do have to do and let's not make it any more complicated or difficult than it needs to be because we have to be efficient to cover some of those costs but there's you know i think we have to be realistic businesses are going to have to suck up some of that sure anything to I add think to if that you look at the over um yeah i i, I think I, I do accept the point um that's been already made that one way, one way or another, you know, customers are at the end of this, whatever happens. But, you know, you, you have to be seen to be uh, efficient and doing the best you can to, to minimise that that cost impact on, on customers. Um, interestingly, in our sector, we uh, I spoke earlier about having a real push on innovation. And, and um, one of our regulators, we're a heavily regulated industry, as you'd expect, as a monopoly um, utility service provider, but um, our economic regulator of what has led the way recently with an innovation fund. And interestingly, uh, that, that fund is um, provided through a levy on all customers uh, across the industry, a standard charge. It's a, it's a small amount of money, it's a few pounds per customer, but then the seed funding for what you need to um, when you when you apply for access to that funding, the, the the amount you have to put in money yourselves as a water company, and that money has to come from your shareholder. So there's an interesting combination there of perhaps uh, the uh, you know uh, the bulk of the money coming from uh, from customer as you would expect to a large degree, but um, uh, you know also shareholders being asked to put up their their, their elements specifically, so that would come out a dividend in effect. All right, thanks, Bob. I'm very conscious of time, so I'm just going to uh, final question. I think it's a really nice, uh, nice place to to, to finish the, the questioning. Actually, is because not all businesses, you know, on the call will be as far down the line as uh, as our respective panelists um, uh, at, at the present time. So the question is, what is the one piece of advice uh, you would give to a customer looking to get started in sustainability? I think the critical thing is, is you know, mapping your current emissions so you know what your starting place is. And I think if you do that right across the supply chain, um, you know, we've t just talked a lot about cost. Actually, you know, what's clear in the energy sector is, you know, if you re-engineer the whole of the supply chain, actually you end up delivering better energy services at lower cost. So but you've got to start off with a clear view of, of, you know, where you are at the moment. So map your map your CO2 emissions. Helen, one, one to finish. Helen, any thoughts there? Um, yeah, just just work out where you're going to have the biggest impact. I mean, we could spend masses of money and put loads of resource into all of the little bits, but it's working out where you're going to get the, the biggest impact, really. And, and understanding your your where your starting point is is key to that. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I am conscious of time. We are, we've just overrun there slightly. So going to sort of 
uh, close the session there. I mean, all that's left to say is a, a huge thank you to, uh, to all the panellists for, for their insights uh, and, and sharing their experiences uh, this morning. So a, uh, a virtual round of applause for, for everyone there, if that's okay for the audience. Um, also to Rob King uh, from HSBC uh, for chairing the discussion uh, superbly, especially sort of managing those technical issues at the very start. So thank you, Rob. Uh, probably uh, mostly to thank you to, to everyone for attending this morning. Hope you enjoyed the session and, uh, and that you continue uh, to engage with the Solent 250. And uh, just on that note, um, we will have follow-up events over the second half of uh, the year. Um, so watch this space for that with the uh, finale uh, of the campaign being the Solent 250 dinner uh, in, uh, in Q4. Um, and it's at that dinner that we'll be celebrating everyone who has made uh, the Solent 250 and also presenting uh, the, uh, the award categories. Uh, so just for awareness, uh, just to sort of let you know what the five award categories are uh, this year. So they are Entrepreneurial Business of the Year, uh, Climate and Sustainability Award, so obviously linked to today's uh, session, Growth and Resilience Award, Business Culture Award, and uh, International Company of the Year. So uh, if you'd like to know any more details on the awards or how to nominate uh, yourself the awards, uh, please speak to either myself uh, or one of the co-sponsors uh, of the Solent 250, the HSBC, RSN or Erwin Mitchell. Um, but uh, for today's session, that's, uh, that's about it. Thank you once again from all the Solent 250 partners uh, and also the Business Magazine uh, for hosting today uh, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much.